Group Wanted. Looking for adventure-loving microorganisms for full-time job on mission to Mars. Teachers TV came to Paris to speak with space travel experts about job opportunities for microorganisms on a trip to Mars. The only catch was our experts were circling the planet. Okay, copy that. Help was being offered by one of France's top broadcasters, TF1. Station Houston, Space Ground 2, we're ready for the voice check. NASA and the European Space Agency would also pitch in to try and arrange a live video link from space. But there's no guarantee the link will work or our experts in orbit will have a clue what we're asking about. And liftoff, liftoff of the Titan III rocket with the Mars Observer and America's return to the Red Planet. There's no shortage of dreams and schemes to explore and exploit the Red Planet. But they'll remain pure fantasy unless scientists can crack a much more fundamental challenge. How to keep astronauts alive and fed during what's likely to be at least a two-year commute to Mars and back. It wouldn't be possible or practical to build a spaceship big enough to carry all the packed lunches and bottled water needed for the 56 million kilometer trek. Such a supersized spaceship would hardly make it off the launching pad. Long distance space travel needs an alternative. In Barcelona, microorganisms are already receiving job interviews for such an alternative. In a university lab, this is the Artospira platensis compartment. It's one of the most closely watched jars of microorganisms anywhere on the planet. So here you have all the instruments for the compartment four. The biomass measurement, temperature measurement, dissolved oxygen, the gas flow, gas composition, and as well weight measurement and pH measurement. It's called MELISSA, which stands for Microecological Life Support System Alternative. A series of compartments rely on microorganisms to provide oxygen, food, and to recycle human waste. So here you have the bioreactor that is in charge of the first step of the degradation of the waste from the crew. Here you have the filling tank that is in charge of filling continuously these wastes. And here you have the ultrafiltration module. So this module is in charge of uh, filtering uh, in a sterile way uh, the liquid phase obtained by this bioreactor. Filtering, sterilizing, and transforming human waste is only one part of Melissa. Melissa system is actually a very reduced ecosystem. We try to reduce the recycling steps into four compartments. Melissa is chasing the holy grail of an artificial ecosystem for long distance space travel. In the early days of space travel, scientists didn't lose sleep worrying about the weight of food rations for long-distance journeys. They had much more immediate concerns. At first, there is considerable controversy whether or not astronauts will be able to swallow solid food or even liquids in weightlessness. Historically, astronauts also acted like earthbound consumers, recycling little, and generating a steady stream of waste. And we throw out all the food containers, put the trash into garbage bags, and bring those bags back to Earth later. Even astronaut feces had to be stored and returned to Earth or discharged into space, where it remains in permanent orbit. The idea of developing a spaceship ecosystem to enable long-term travel is one that Soviet and American space agencies started tinkering with more than 40 years ago. Previous experiments with spaceship ecosystems focused on the role of plants as a source of fresh food and oxygen. Now this is the variable pressure growth chamber uh, where we grow our wheat which pr provides the oxygen for me to breathe, it takes up my carbon dioxide. These are being grown in, in hydroponic solution uh, rather than normal soils. The Melissa project goes several steps further. To recreate a terrestrial ecosystem, even in a smaller scale, takes some time. So the first 10 years, more or less, has been spent on the screening of these microorganisms in order to be able to detect them and to identify them and characterize them. So roughly, Melissa today is a bit more than 20 years old.
Melissa is actually mimicking an ecosystem, a lake ecosystem, where there are different groups of bacteria degrading the organic waste, recycling also all the nitrogen to finally produce again oxygen and uh, potable water, so purified water and also food. Creating artificial and transportable ecosystems has been tried before, but on a much bigger scale. Biosphere 2 in the Arizona desert even had its own lake. Microorganisms on the surface of lakes typically use sunlight to absorb CO2 and produce oxygen. Different microbes at the bottom break down sludge. On Earth, ecosystems have large buffer capacities. To build such an artificial ecosystem is really a big challenge. You need a lot of equipment and um, high-tech bioreactors to surely control all these processes within very narrow um, ranges. This is a lake, unlike any you've ever seen. It's got a lot of twists and turns to make sure no waste goes to waste. And that's been a challenge since the earliest days of space travel. Within the Melissa loop, we try to select as much as possible bacteria that do not need oxygen their cells to survive or to biodegrade the waste. Because of course, in such a, a space capsule, you want to preserve all the oxygen that you have for the crew. Anaerobic is a type of microorganism that does not need oxygen or sunlight and is highly prized by Melissa. Thermophilic is a type of microbe which works well in very high temperatures, also very useful for breaking down human waste. It also helps for some microbes to be cellulitic, which means having a knack for breaking down cellulose found in the inedible parts of plants. This gang of microbes used to break down waste turn big molecules into smaller ones. Then these organic molecules, which are reduced to smaller ones, volatile uh, fatty acids, are sent to a second compartment, another bacterium. The bioreactor is transforming this ammonia into nitrate through this piping and through the filtration step to this harvesting tank. The nitrate we produce is actually given to a plant compartment to produce food and oxygen. Astronauts have gotten used to eating food out of toothpaste tubes and meals that are freeze-dried, thermostabilized and irradiated to prevent spoilage. Eating fresh fruit from Melissa would be a welcome treat, but eating food grown with the nutrients of your own waste might require a psychological adjustment. In another compartment is the superstar microorganism spirulina. In bright lights, the spirulina thrives as it uses photosynthesis to convert CO2 from the cabin atmosphere into fresh oxygen. The green spirulina algae grows fast and has untapped potential as a space food entree or as an ingredient in any space travel recipe. If your recipe or your dishes is, is, is dark green, there is a kind of reluctance to, to eat this product. People wonder what it is. Yeah? It's a bit as the, the kids with spinach. We have discussed uh, with a large number of uh, astronauts over the last years. And what we have always heard is, please improve the food quality. Melissa promises a great menu. But there's no guarantee that microbes working in microgravity and bombarded with cosmic radiation will perform as they do on Earth. The risk of mutation has been considered almost from the early days of Melissa. If you have microorganisms and you cultivate them in an environment which is not by definition their uh, own environment, 
the risk of mutation, the risk of evolution has to be considered. We know that in space the dose of radiation is higher, but also the type of radiation is very different. Any biological organism is experiencing an evolution, genetic evolution, over time, over multiple generations. In nature, most microorganisms are actually adapting to their new environment and their new conditions. Some Melissa microorganisms have managed part-time jobs on the International Space Station for a relatively brief but direct encounter with cosmic radiation and microgravity. When they come back, we analyze them fully uh, on the DNA level, but also on the level of their RNA or proteins that they have produced. Genetic evolutions can be beneficial or can be harmful for such a system. Long-term tests in space of microbes used in Melissa to grow food or break down waste are yet to occur. Other experiments have found that some microbes reproduce more rapidly in conditions of microgravity and cosmic radiation, and that a dangerous microbe such as Salmonella can become even more dangerous. Many questions remain unanswered. Back in Paris, we're still hoping to ask an orbiting astronaut just how far he's willing to trust microorganisms if his life depended on them. We actually open a coordination line separately from the, from the audio line with NASA so that we can talk to them right the way through the process. A video link has finally been established. I've seen them get ready in a few seconds, so I'm never concerned. But we've been told it will last only a matter of minutes. Other broadcasters, including CNN and CBS, are muscling in on the little time there'll be to chat. Hi guys, it's Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, and then, a space age miracle. Okay, we have one more question from Teachers TV from Britain. Thank you, greetings, greetings from Earth. In planning a long-term mission to Mars, the role of microorganisms is expected to play a very vital role in supplying oxygen, food, and recycling waste. Can Commander Divina and his colleagues please comment on the potential benefits and risks of being so dependent on microorganisms for such vital needs? Yes, of course. Uh, the European Space Agency has a program called uh, MELISA, which actually looks into a full recycling system with uh, microorganisms. And we do a lot of science here on board of the International Space Station, looking how these microorganisms uh, resist uh, the radiation uh, levels here on board of the International Space Station and how they uh, perform in, in microgravity. So there's still a lot of work uh, that will need to be done. Uh, for sure, there is a risk involved, but that's why in the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years, we will be able to utilize the International Space Station to develop all these technologies, to do all the science that we need to do, and then to be ready to embark on this big journey. Merci beaucoup, Franck Devine, d'avoir été avec nous ce soir sur TF1.